equivalent to me of using the Swift system in the world of smartphones, the world of high-speed internet is like, you know, deciding to go from the USA to France on a rowboat instead of using a plane. Welcome to the Bitcoin Basics podcast with your hosts, Faris and Gordon from CoinCompass.com, enabling you to safely buy and securely store your Bitcoins. All resources are in the show notes and description, including our disclaimer. Visit BitcoinBasicsPodcast.com to subscribe and discover other free content. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, everyone. Welcome to another Bitcoin Basics podcast with your host, Gordon. That's me, and I've got Faris with me as well. And we're continuing our series of Bitcoin Begins, and this is the fourth episode. So if you haven't listened to the previous ones, have a look at the link in the description. I'll put the playlist there and you can play along. In our previous episode, we looked at what is Bitcoin and and why we need Bitcoin. And we compared it with gold and we looked at the US dollar and the um, gold standard and why we needed this new money, this new store of value. So today we're looking at what is the Bitcoin blockchain. And I preface that with Bitcoin because there are other blockchains. So Faris, why do we need a Bitcoin blockchain? What are the issues with the current financial system? Thanks, Gordon. And uh, yeah, for everyone listening, uh, for me, this was the one it took me a long time to really understand what is the blockchain. And I'm very lucky to have Gordon who comes from an IT um, security background to explain this to me. So hopefully today we're going to give you broad strokes in layman's terms to really understand what this is. So the current financial system, to be involved in that, you actually need to have a bank account. And that sounds very simple to most of us. However, half of the world's adult population do not have a bank account and cannot access it. So this means that not only are they unable to send and receive funds from overseas, they are basically can't do that domestically, they're potentially stuck in a barter system, they can't get a home loan, they can't borrow to invest in a stock market. So they're missing out on this. So when half the world's adult population do not have access to a bank account, but they can get a mobile phone, and there's more mobile phones in the world than people, then that eliminates that problem. That eliminates that third party, the bank, and you can just go directly to these people. So if I want to invest in a microbrewery in Nigeria, and the person who wants to set up that microbrewery um, can't get a PayPal account, can't get a bank account, can't get a Swift account, well, Bitcoin renders that irrelevant. I can just send them Bitcoins and they'll receive them within 20 minutes. And also, Ferris, uh, how about you and I? I want to send you some money from my undisclosed location to your undisclosed location in New Zealand. Why do we need a third party still? You and I trust each other. So wh- why do we need these banking systems and uh, SWIFT and whatnot? Exactly. I-, I don't know. And it is a very archaic system. Um, And there are governments around the world now saying we actually need to change the system. Um, The equivalent to me of using the SWIFT system in the world of smartphones, the world of high-speed internet is like, you know, deciding to go from the USA to France on a rowboat instead of using a plane. Sounds painful. Okay, so we've mentioned uh, Bitcoin, and uh, basically Bitcoin removes the need for a third party. So you and I can send Bitcoin transactions without a bank, without a clearinghouse, without someone like a Swift or any private or public institution. How does it do that? How does the Bitcoin network do that? And so far we've been talking about Bitcoin, the currency, and today we're obviously going to be talking about Bitcoin, the technology. There are many buzzwords, and I'll try to keep the buzzword bingo to a minimum. We talk about the blockchain. Other people talk about the Bitcoin network. Uh, Those sort of words are synonymous. There are really three ways, and we'll go through each of these um, individually, of how the Bitcoin blockchain solves problems with the current financial system. And the first one is actually... The, the probably the most important one, and it's about control and ownership. You probably heard the words decentralized and distributed before, but I'll go through them again. And if you think of the current financial system, your bank or any sort of institution or even a website, 
it has a central repository. So it is centralized and it's centralized because that company or that institution owns the data. So when you go to facebook.com, facebook.com is essentially a giant database. Facebook owns that data. Now you can access your data, but Facebook owns all the data. So it is centralized. One step above that is something which we call distributed. So we have this notion of say cloud storage and everyone's familiar with Google Drive or iCloud or um, uh, Microsoft's uh, SkyDrive or OneDrive. And it is centralized. So Microsoft or Google or Apple still owns that data and still controls that data. But that data isn't in one central location, like a bank's database or an accounting firm's database. It's actually distributed. So there may be five or six or 10 copies around the world. So when you upload your photo from your iPhone to iCloud, that's not just at Apple's North American data center. That's probably copied four or five times around the world, which means if there's a failure at any one of those locations, they can simply switch to a backup. So we've got these two notions. We've got this notion of centralized, which is really control, and distributed or having a single copy of something. And the banking system is extremely centralized and there's really only one copy. So when you look at your local bank, they have a ledger or a database, which they try to protect and they own. So they own it and they protect it. The unique thing about Bitcoin is it really flips that model completely on its head. And what it does is something which is called outside and it basically flips it so that instead of it being centralized, one copy, it's actually decentralized. And instead of it being private and owned by one institution, it's actually public and made available to basically whoever wants to own it. And before I ha hand it on to Faris to uh, <laughs> give an analogy, that's what we call peer-to-peer. -peer. And you'll hear that word quite a lot when you listen to Bitcoin because there's no one central location, one central server or one central website. You've got copies of this Bitcoin blockchain, which we'll get into in a moment, all across the world. So there are 10,000, 20,000 copies of the Bitcoin network running all across the world. It's not owned by anyone. It's completely public and it is what we call decentralized. Faris, how do I go with that explanation? If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, and share so we can find others like yourself. Uh, Gordon, I really like how you've defined the differences between distributed and decentralized. And um, it's something that unfortunately is still misunderstood. So a centralized financial system or a centralized ledger is where, for example, you have, um, let's just take a village where you have an accountant that's running the village and he's in charge of everyone's in expenditures and um sorry, incomings and outgoings. So all the credits and debits, he's the, there's one person who's keeping track of that. Now he could make a mistake. Um, he could end up getting bribed and there's no way of disputing that. It's one ledger, an entire village can basically um, is under the influence or the control of that one person. That's centralized. Distributed, like you said, is just the same thing, but copied in different locations, and the same problem can occur. It's a, you know, essentially, essentially a copy and paste. Yeah. Um, with decentralized, what that's saying is that everyone who's involved has a copy of the ledger, and as soon as a transaction takes place, they update their own copy. So if you wanted to influence that transaction, you would have to um, influence everyone's copy. They would have to, of their own accord, change that. And that's just not going to happen because everyone has witnessed a transaction. Everyone records that transaction. So that's how decentralized works. It's everyone working together, but also working anonymously. So uh, it's really difficult to explain simply because it goes against everything we've learned, where you go to the bank, you give the money to the bank, you trust the bank. With this model, you're actually trusting people you don't know. But you're not just trusting people you don't know, you're trusting tens of thousands of people you don't know. And that's what makes it robust because they don't know you, 
you don't know them, you cannot influence them, and they cannot influence you. So what it is, is, is the democratization of finance. When you know, we have elections coming up in countries, when you vote for these people, you don't know who's voted for you. It's anonymous. Bitcoin blockchain works the same way. Everyone is voting and it's anonymous. It is actually the democratization of finance and it is really, it's very difficult to explain simply and succinctly, unfortunately. I'm trying my best. I don't know. I don't know how I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Faris. I'm, I'm in the same boat. We don't want to make it too simple and dumb it down because then you don't really learn anything. But then again, we don't want to do a four-hour podcast because uh, people will quickly uh, switch off. Yeah, and as the, the key to Bitcoin and the blockchain, which we'll explain in a second, is this decentralized nature. And you'll hear this time and time again. What that means is nobody controls it. So nobody controls this ledger. Um, nobody can actually, you know, change records and whatnot. And the other two properties come from this decentralization. So the Bitcoin blockchain is transparent. It's a public ledger. So unlike your bank, where, you know, if the bank's feeling nice and friendly, they'll give access to your financial records and you can see your stuff, but you certainly can't see everyone else's stuff. And uh, without being too political, um, you know, um, if there's a disaster relief or even in this, uh, um, Cerveza beer crisis. Uh, imagine being able to see where governments spend the money and unemployment benefits and whatnot. Um, mm. So yeah, so the Bitcoin ledger is transparent and that transparency comes because there isn't just one person that you have to trust, the third party. It's being distributed and decentralized amongst many people. And the third property and the final property, and that there are many properties, but this is probably the the other major one is something called immutability. So in a normal computer system or database, you can change stuff. So you think of a database, you know, your contact list in your mobile phone or your um, website's blog or even Facebook, you can add something to it. You can edit those details and you can delete those details. So there's three things that you can do. The Bitcoin blockchain and, and computer scientists are probably going to scream at me for saying this is really a database. Um, financial people call it a distributed ledger. Okay, that's fine. It's a database, but unlike a traditional database where you can create, update, or edit and delete stuff, you can only create stuff. So with the Bitcoin blockchain, you can only add to it. So you can't edit transactions in the past and you can't delete transactions. This has enormous implications, especially when you consider that the Bitcoin blockchain is distributed, so no one owns it. That has uh, properties like you can't censor transactions. So whether someone is doing a legitimate transaction, whether someone is doing whatever they want, you can't actually censor those transactions. There's no bank account with the Bitcoin network, the Bitcoin blockchain. So accounts can't be frozen because they donated to the wrong political party or the government didn't like them for whatever reason. And so the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain has completely flipped the traditional model of how we think about accounting, economics, and money. And basically, it's the complete opposite. Every single aspect, every single attribute that you look of in the traditional system, like having a third party, like it being owned and controlled by a single entity, is um, Bitcoin basically solves it. Now, the question is, Faris, how does Bitcoin solve it? And that's where we get into the meat and potatoes and we look at the inner workings of the blockchain. To put you on the spot, <laughs> um, <laughs> how does the Bitcoin blockchain work? So the analogy I like most, yeah, a let's keep in mind a ledger of transactions. Now, um, when you have a ledger book, you just simply write money going in, money going out, and then you have a total on the far right column. And same thing with a Bitcoin wallet. If I were to send Gordon Bitcoins, um, my, you know, that money comes out of my Bitcoin wallet and into his, and that's recorded on the blockchain. And that transaction is confirmed within about 10 minutes. And 
that transaction is confirmed by what we call miners. Um, and miners are basically, what they're doing is they're solving a mathematical formula to confirm that transaction. Now I'm going to a bit of detail here, but you'll come across Bitcoin mining. You don't really need to understand the intricacies of Bitcoin mining. What you need to do is mining is what is is what computers are doing. They're crunching formulas to um, confirm Bitcoin transactions. That's what they're doing. Um, if you want to go into more detail about that, we've done several podcasts about it. But to me, understanding um, Bitcoin mining is like understanding how a plane works. I kind of know how a plane works. It's you know, it's got wings, it's got an engine, and it's fighting against gravity. If I were to look in the cockpit or in the hood, I've got no idea what's going on. Um, so that's in essence how transactions work. I send Gordon a transaction. That transaction is confirmed by Bitcoin miners, and that is creates a block in the chain of transactions. So the term blockchain comes from that. So if you can imagine a pyramid, and each stone in a pyramid is a block of transactions. So my Bitcoin sent to Gordon are blocked in. Are part of a block of several other transactions around the world. These blocks are confirmed every 10 minutes on average. That creates the first block in a pyramid. And then the, at 10 minutes later, another one comes along, then another one. Now, they cannot be reverse engineered. Um, I Gordon cannot say, you never sent me those Bitcoins. It's set in stone. It's part of a block. It's irreversible. And the more transactions that take place, the more rigid, the more irreversible is the blockchain. And it's been around for 10 years now that it is basically, it's not going anywhere. It is an undisputed, irreversible ledger. Um, Gordon, I tried really hard to keep that succinct. How did I do? No, that's 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 perfect. And just to follow on from that, and, and I think the pyramid's a good analogy, just to follow on from that, people sort of ask often ask me, why 10 minutes and why why this blockchain? And the reason behind it is with your traditional bank and when you go to an ATM, you put in your card and you withdraw money, that is contacting a single server or a single website, a single database. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they can do that is because your bank controls it. But you can't do that with Bitcoin. You can't have these instantaneous mm -hmm. transactions because there is no one central server. Bitcoin is decentralized and distributed. There are many copies of the ledger that need to be verified. So instead of thinking like this transaction happened at 10.38 a.m. and five seconds, we think of it in not in terms of transactions, but in terms of blocks. So all these transactions are simply gathered up together in blocks of 10 minutes. And it's basically just taking the um, model from the banks and saying, okay, individual transactions. In the Bitcoin blockchain, individual transactions and now blocks. So for example, if I try to send Faris some money that I previously sent um, a day ago, then the Bitcoin network rejects that because that transaction occurred in you know, minus um, 120 blocks or whatever it was in the past. But if I try to send Faris one transaction and then five seconds later, I try to send him another transaction, well, there could be enormous confusion in the Bitcoin network because remember, it's an international system. There are miners all around the world and I could potentially try to steal Faris's money or do what is called a double spend, spend my money on two separate products. And so that would cause enormous confusion. So we have this analogy of blocks and that's all it is, just a, a group of transactions, 1,000, 2,000 transactions grouped together into a block. And for those who are listening to our podcast on a regular basis, we start the show with a proof of recording. We mention the price and we also mention the block height. We can just call the block number. And that's all it is. It's, it's basically a, a number in sequence that, that has all these transactions. And I guess last but not least, Faris, um, you briefly mentioned Bitcoin mining. A another question that I get is, well, why, do, why do people want to run these Bitcoin miners? Well, what's their incentive? What's their motivation for running these miners to verify and validate all these transactions that are going around the Bitcoin network? Yeah, so when you're running a Bitcoin miner, um, What's your output? Your output is 
the electricity that you're paying for. Um, a, you actually need to buy some hardware these days um, called a nice ASIC miner. And you actually, it's cost of electricity to, to spend it. So you're spending money keeping the network going. Now, you're not actually doing that out of the goodness of your heart because you believe in Bitcoin. You're doing it because you get rewarded in um, Bitcoins. Um, so that's, that is your reward for keeping the network secure. You're actually getting paid for Bitcoins. And just like you, if you were to send money overseas using a bank, you have to pay a transaction fee. When I send Gordon Bitcoins from my wallet, um, then also the miners get a small transaction fee as well. And sorry, just one clarification, guys. I know I'm saying Bitcoins a lot, but just remember that when we're using that term, we're actually talking about fragments of a Bitcoin. So you don't have to send an entire Bitcoin, two or three. Bitcoin is divisible up to eight decimal points. So I could send Gordon $5 um, worth of Bitcoins. Yeah, the, 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 um, the word Satoshis has really came around the last uh, year or two. So remember, as far as said, eight decimal points is one 100 millionth of a Bitcoin you can go down to, which is called a Satoshi. So I think the vernacular from now on, Faris, is we send Satoshis to each yeah. other, not Bitcoins <laughs> to each other. Um, I, I couldn't afford to send any Bitcoins. So, um, so I think uh, without going into too much detail, that's it. We do have many podcasts, as Faris mentioned. I will link three in the description of the show notes where we do tackle Bitcoin mining. We also tackle the Bitcoin network and nodes and mm -hmm. mining and whole, how all that works. But to sum up, Faris, I would say that the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a buzzword that a lot of marketing people use, it's not, not, it's not anything magical. It's just a new way of storing data in this ledger. And the, the reason why it works is because it's public, not private, and it is decentralized and distributed, not centralized and control. And that's how it works. It, it's such a simple system. Yes, the technology behind it might be complicated, but the simple system in that it incentivizes people to do the right thing. Yep. And that means that the Bitcoin network is basically the most secure network in the whole world. I mean, we, we don't go a week without hearing some sort of hack of people having their credit cards stolen from stores and identity theft and whatnot. So uh, it's amazing that the Bitcoin network is so secure and it uses the complete opposite rules and technology that uh, has existed for hundreds of years in the traditional banking system. So that's it from me, Faris. Any final thoughts of Bitcoin and blockchain? Um, yeah, just one thing. So uh, we mentioned banks getting hacked and there's stuff in the news that comes out about um, Bitcoin exchanges getting hacked. That's completely different to the uh, the blockchain itself. So an exchange is actually a third party where you, people buy and sell Bitcoins. When they get hacked, it's completely irrelevant to the Bitcoin blockchain itself. Good point. Okay, so that concludes our fourth episode in the series. If you have any questions whatsoever, coincompass.com slash ask. We'd appreciate if you liked and shared this episode, whether you're listening to it on your podcast player on YouTube, head across to bitcoinbasicspodcast.com and subscribe. Is that it? I'd say so, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. pretty happy with that. Thanks for watching or listening. Please visit coincompass.com slash free to register to our socials and discover other free content. Subscribing, liking, and following helps this content remain ad-free. Until next time.